know, people have all sorts of solutions to solve different problems. I was probably about 18 years old. I had one of the most beautiful 1978 Bobcats. For those of you who don't know, that's a, a chromed Pinto. And it is something that, um, as an 18-year-old, is like, well, it's, it's, it's not a Ferrari, it's not a Mustang, but it's something that got me to and from work. And it had a problem. And I had an odd way of solving that problem. I took a trip down to West Palm Beach in this Bobcat, and um, I knew going forward that it had an oil leak. Um, one so possible solution for me to do, because whenever I would have, and it's amazing what modern technology does, is it sends this little red light and puts it on your dash with a little oil thingy there saying oil low. It doesn't say oil out, it just says low. And you know, I could have put, one solution I could have done was just get a piece of electrical tape, put it over that light, problem solved. But that really wouldn't have solved my problem. You know what I did? My solution to the problem wasn't fix the oil gasket that was surrounding it to stop the oil leak. My solution was continue to put oil in until it would run no more. Until I saw that light, when I saw that light, hey, it's time for oil. You know, there are a lot of solutions that we like to apply to our lives that they get us by, maybe. But they aren't the solutions that actually fix the problem. This morning, I'd ask for us to all say, Lord, you have a solution for my life. Show me the solution, and I'll do what it takes. I'll do the solution. I'll take the solution that you provide me and apply it to my life. Will you make commitments with me this morning that if God shows you that's the solution, don't put a piece of electrical tape over the light, but I'm going to do what you want me to do. Well, let's seal this in prayer this morning. Father, thank you so much for loving us the way you do. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins and, and, and giving us your Holy Spirit, giving us brothers and sisters that care for us, showing us the patience that you have for us, and so often we Ignore that patience that you bless us with. Father, we ask that you'd work through me to bring the burden of your heart, to recognize the solution you have for us. Father, we've made commitments that you show us that solution, and we'll do it. Father, give us the strength, the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding, the conviction, and the zeal to do what you tell us to do. In your son's holy name we ask it, Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes circumstances occur in our lives that cause us to question whether to continue on that course or just to give up. But it isn't circumstance alone. It is circumstance plus something that determines that we give up, we continue, we slow down, we speed up. I've heard of people who have lost their legs and said they'll never walk again. The attitude is, what's the use? No one can ever love me, I'm gonna be a burden on everyone, I'll never walk again. Who would ever want me? But sometimes those circumstances break the chains we've been bound by that we never knew imprisoned us. A young officer who was blinded during the war met and later married one of the nurses who took care of him in an army hospital. One day he overheard someone speaking about himself and his wife. 
And they said, it's lucky for her that he was blind since he would have never married such a homely woman if he had had eyes. He rose to his feet and walked to the voices saying, I overheard what you said. And I thank God from the depths of my heart for the blindness of eyes that might have kept me from seeing the marvelous worth of the soul of this woman who is, in my, who is my wife. She is the most notable character I have ever known. If confirmation of her features is such that I might have masked, that it might have masked her inward beauty to my soul, then I am a great gainer by having lost my sight. The Bible is filled with circumstances in their lives of people like saying this is the last nail in the coffin. I can't go on. But because of a substance that is joined with that circumstances, chains were broken, joys were restored, miracles happened, and prisoners were set free. What is that substance? It's faith. Let's begin looking at a man who was, that had a great, terrible thing happen to him. A wealthy man, an educated man. Some would say he was even a family man. If you would turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. We'll begin reading in verse 22. Mark 5, verse 22. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at, at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay hands on her that she may be healed, and she shall live. Jairus has a daughter who is so sick, it's to the point of death. The Bible doesn't say that he took her little girl to the doctor or not. He is aware of the reputation of Jesus. He's heard that he's a great teacher. He can heal the sick, make the lame to walk, restore the sight of the blind. He does what a loving father would do. The Bible says he besought him greatly. He searches high and low and finally finds him. But he does something that you don't see happening today. How many fathers do you know that when they bring their child to the doctor, that is to the point of death, that they get on their knees and pleads with the doctor and says, save her life. Please save my child. But this man does. Continue reading in verse 24. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman who had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things by many physicians had spent all that she had was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she, came, when she had heard of Jesus, came in and pressed behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I will be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? 
And the disciples said, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the, her, all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now I want you to notice something here. Jesus agreed to go with Jairus. They leave and head for the house. The dad is filled with hope. He knows that every second counts in his daughter's life. You can imagine that, Dad. Jesus, the fastest way to my house is directly through Main Street. But something happens that stretches this man's patience and his faith. Someone slows Jesus down. What would be your attitude if your child was at the point of death, the doctor is in the car, and traffic has slowed you down? Would you be there honking your horn, yelling all sorts of profanities? Someone should probably move out of the way or get a bulldozer. You just run right through them, take an excurt, go off the side of the road, and not caring about anyone or anything. But the Bible doesn't record this reaction to this dad. If there was ever a time for the devil to attack this dad's faith, it would be now. It would be with the thought, every second counts, Jesus. Hurry up, my daughter is dying. Jesus, don't lose focus here. You promised me that you would go heal my daughter. You're here for me and my daughter, not anybody else. Jesus, you promised. Let's go. Don't worry about who touched you. Let's get going. But we don't see that in the life of this dad. We don't see this in the life of this man who says, my daughter is at the point of death and she's going to die. As a matter of fact, we don't hear a word out of that dad. What we see next is not just a seed of doubt, but the stone-cold news of hopelessness. It's no use. Just give up. Verse 35. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? There would be some dads that when they got this news would immediately fly off the handle. Jesus, it's your fault. If you hadn't stopped to see who touched you, she could have lived. He could have pointed the finger at this woman. Do you see this? You're a murderer. If you hadn't stopped here, my daughter would still be alive. I know some people who would automatically point fingers like that. But again, we don't see this attitude, this action in this dad. Look what Jesus says in verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the words that was spoken, he said unto her, uh, said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel's not dead, 
but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when, they had, when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entereth into the, where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talith kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked for she was a, of the age of 12 years old, or 12, age of 12 years. And they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it and command that something should be given her to eat. Some of you may say, and Steve, are you teaching that the next time a sickness happens, all I have to do is believe and I will be healed? Our topic isn't on healing. But let me say this. It isn't the will of God that everyone be healed while we're here on this earth. There is a purpose for everything that God does or allows. Two men of God, Paul and Trophimus, both got sick. Paul, we know, wasn't healed. And Trophimus, we don't know whether he recovered or not. What I'm saying, in the middle of what you consider to be a terrible and tra tragic occurrence, when friends and family say, don't bother God with it, and have left you, when you don't see the light of the end of the tunnel, when you believe the only thing, the only person in the room is the devil, don't give up but turn those circumstances into successes. By applying the measure of faith that's been given you into him. If this man walked away, threw up his faith, He would have never seen his child awake. He would have never seen his, the 13th birthday party of his child. But he kept that faith. But faith is worthless in itself. If faith is not properly founded, it can lead to nothing other than disaster. One night, Cars sped along the main highway between Jackson and Vicksburg, Mississippi. The drivers had faith in their cars and in the bridges over streams. They passed over some of these bridges at 50 to 60 miles an hour. Everything was lovely. The concrete spans stood firm over the rivers and bayous. And the cars just went on their way. Suddenly the taillights of a truck disappeared into the highway. The driver of the truck caught only a glimpse of a black gap in the concrete before he plunged into the stream below. Breaking the glass of the window, he was able to get out of the truck and swim to shore. Frantically, this man tried to flag down cars traveling. The drivers ignored this dripping, wet, scarecrow figure and just sped into the void. Each time, there was a single booming splash, sometimes followed by a, a few shouts or screams. All these drivers had faith in the bridge that was out. There's only one bridge across the Gulf of Death. Jesus said, no man cometh to the Father but by me. Faith must have a proper foundation, and that is Jesus. This man, Jairus, had that faith in Jesus. Where is your faith founded in? A church? A religion? Man's wisdom? What about the love of a spouse, a relative, a friend? Be warned, if your faith isn't in Christ, 
and nothing else, you could be very well have a disaster at your doorstep. Let's take a look at another man who is in severe pain. So much pain because the skin blistered from his head to his foot. It is thought by some theologians that it was a, a form of black leprosy or smallpox. The only comfort, if you will consider it comfort, was he would get a piece of broken ceramic and scrape the boils from off his arms and his legs and wherever they may have occurred. And then go and sit in dirty ashes. If you would, let's look at this man in Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2 in verse 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast in his, his integrity. Although thou movest me against him, to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thy hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hand, but save his life. So when Satan, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to unto his crown. And he took him a potter, that's that broken ceramic piece I was telling you about, to scrape himself with all. And he sat down among the ashes. Then said he, then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still Retain thine integrity, curse God, and die. Of all the people that you would hope to take pity on you, you would hope it would be your spouse. Job didn't have that. What kind of encouragement did Job get from his wife? The only encouragement she gave was to hurry up and die. Just give up. Get it over with, Job. She even discourages Job from being faithful to the Lord by saying, why are you going to be faithful to the Lord? What has he done for you? Look at all that you're doing, Job. You've been faithful. How has God rewarded you for that? Oh, all those boils. Your children have all died now. And on top of that, all the savings account, every penny that you have has been stolen. Look at verse 10. Job rebukes his wife. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did Job did not Job sin with his lips. Turn back a page and look at, at, at chapter 1 and verse 21. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Job is saying, I entered into this world with nothing, and I shall take nothing with me. All the blessings in between came from him. And he has full authority to do with it as he pleases. And I'm going to bless him for everything he has given me. 
So what happens when your faith conflicts with your sight? When you say to the Lord, I have put my faith in you. I'm going to be obedient to what you want me to do. You go so far, and then you begin to fall. You look around and say, there is no way I can succeed. There's no way I can overcome this. There's no way I can stop. I'm surrounded by things that just take me down. Now, there was a man like that, too, in the Bible. If you would turn to Matthew chapter 14. This was a disciple of Jesus. Matthew chapter 14. Begin reading in verse 23. Matthew 14, verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. We're talking about Jesus. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went into them, walking in the sea. Now, the fourth watch of the night, the night is divided into four sections. The fourth watch would be around 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Notice what is happening with the disciples that are in the ship. Apparently, there's a storm brewing. The boat is being tossed back and forth. The wind is blowing in every direction. And it being 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning, it's pretty dark outside. Verse 26. And when the disciples saw him walking in the sea, on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit! And they cried out with, for fear. And straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if thou, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me! And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Peter recognized the voice of Jesus, and Jesus asked Jesus to let him come to him. He got out of the ship. He began to walk in the water, but then begins to sink. Why? The Bible says he started to look around. And the wind, how bad it was. In the middle of a circumstance that most wouldn't even attempt to go to Jesus. I don't know if a storm has happened and I see Jesus there. It says, he's heading my direction. Well, you can come. I'll wait here. Peter's saying, I, I, can I come to you? To me, that's a amount of faith. Most would have stayed in the, in the boat, in the safety of the boat. Jesus would have been there in a few seconds. But Peter takes the road less traveled. He wants to go to him. Jesus told Peter what the problem was. It wasn't because he had no faith. It was that he had little faith. What happened? He started with strong faith. But that quickly diminished because his faith was replaced with a boat anchor called sight. When Peter started walking in the water, it didn't matter that the winds were gusting. His eyes were fixed on Jesus. 
Don't limit your faith by what you see. In the middle of every circumstance, do you look to Jesus? Don't give up. In Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. Proverbs 24, 16. There is a scripture that should encourage you to get up when a trial or a problem knocks you down. Proverbs 24, verse 16 says, For a man falleth seven times and riseth again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Something knocked that just man down. First time, I'm not going to get up. I can't do this. He didn't do that. He got back up. I am going to continue to get back up. Was it one of those... I just went to school, the little weeble wobbles. They, you can knock them down, they come back up. No, this, this, had, this man, this just man says, I'm knocked down, I'm getting back up. In a study of 130 toddlers, ages 12 to 19 months old, the researchers found that toddlers fell on an average of 17 times an hour. If they were new walkers, they fell an average of 69 times an hour. It goes on to tell that the average two-year-old falls 38 times a day. One of the reasons they attributed these falls are not because they didn't have strength, but because their vision is farsighted and they have trouble judging distances. Don't let sight hinder your faith. I mentioned earlier that faith is worthless in itself. It needs to be founded in the right person. No greater love has ever been shown to you than that of Jesus laying his down, life down for you. We didn't do anything to deserve that kind of love. You didn't do any good deed to do that. There is no pastry, no great task you can do that merits God's love. but he loved you just the same. He laid his life down for you and me. And we don't deserve it. That sounds like where we should be putting our faith. Some of you have lived the whole, your whole life in church or around religion. And it's far time to put your faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord instead of religion. How do you put your faith in him? Well, you do what it says. You believe him. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Every one. Praise God for that. Amen. Every spot the blood of Christ covers. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not in us. This morning, the circumstances that you're going in, that on, and no one else knows but you. So you think, but God knows. What will you do in that circumstance? Will you give up? Or use what faith you have and commit to the Lord? Say, Lord, I don't know why this is happening. 
or maybe you do and you're fighting. But I'm turning it over to you this morning. What will you do in the middle of a circumstance? Will you give up and say, God, it's your fault? Like Jairus could have done, but he didn't. He says, God, I know you're faithful. Job said the same thing. In the middle of all the circumstances that he had, he, the Bible records that he never sinned with his lips. And to the contrary of most people today, when something terrible happens, they point their finger at God and says, God, it's your fault. But we don't see that with Job. We don't see that with Jairus. How do we live? Do we give thanks? Do we say, blessed be your name, Lord? This morning, you've, we've, I've, I've presented a number of people who've gone through different extreme circumstances. Who invested their faith and some little faith or strong faith but got knocked down. What will you do with that this morning? What will you do with the faith that's been given you? Will you invest it? Lord's spoken to you this morning. He's provided a solution. It's your choice. What will you do? If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you can know that today. You can have that relationship with Him. We just went over 1 John and says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Are you going to believe what His Word says? He's made a promise to you. Do that this morning. In a few moments, you're going to walk out those doors. You're not promised a quarter mile down the road. And you'll be called, an accident may happen, who knows, you may die in that quarter mile. And this moment where you had the opportunity to commit the things that God has told you about, you've ignored. In this moment, the Lord will present to you, says, look, you were warned, but you didn't do anything about it. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, please don't walk out those doors without asking for His forgiveness. Not just making Him Savior, but making Him Lord of your life. Father, thank You for who You are. Thank You for Your mercy and Your patience that You show us. Help us to be the salt that you've called us to be and the light that you've called us to be. We pray for those who, who have made decisions that you would be with them. Give them the wisdom. Help them to take the strength that you provide. We pray for those that are, are struggling and battling you. Father, open their eyes to see the things that need to be done. Remind them of your great love that you've shown them by sending your son to die on the cross for them. We ask these things in your son's holy name, Jesus' name, amen.